Hello everyone, and thank you for joining our Pure Storage webinar this morning. Um, so we are joined here by Max Brown, UK Systems Engineer at Pure Storage, who will be presenting the webinar today. And then also we are joined by Stuart Curry, Storage Specialist uh, from Bytes. So just before we start, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping details with you. Uh, so you will be muted throughout the webinar, but we'll be holding a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so if you do have any questions, you can just pop those in the questions box, which are at the right-hand side of your screen, and those will, will be answered at the end. Um, so the webinar will be recorded, and we'll, we will send this to you shortly after the webinar today, and it's also going to be made available on our website. Uh, so once the webinar is finished, you'll see that a critique form uh, will pop up. So if you could please fill that out, that would be really useful. Um, so we can get one of our bite specialists to call you back with more information if you would like that. Okay, so I'm now going to pass you over to Stuart Curry, um, who's going to discuss the relationship between bytes and pure storage in a little more detail. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Amy, uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, just want to uh, say thank you for taking some time out uh, this morning to, to listen myself, to myself and uh, to Pure Storage, talk about uh, Flash and the drives for Flash into the market. Um, the slide in front of you just gives you sort of an indication in terms of uh, the four pillars of focus for, from Byte's perspective. Some of you may, mainly know us um, traditionally from our software licensing perspective and software asset management. So I won't focus too much in and around those areas, but uh, as an organization we are um, uh, a market leader in, the, in those two, uh, two, two, two pillars. Uh, Bytes as a business, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, is, uh, has uh, three offices in the UK, uh, Manchester, uh, York and Leatherhead. Uh, we're around about 150 million staff, uh, sorry, 150 million turnover with about 200 staff. Uh, and we're part of the Nortrin Group, which is uh, based out of South Africa, which is a, a two billion pound business. The two areas I want to focus on today um, and drive your attention towards is the cloud service pillar and the data infrastructure pillar. Uh, recently, we've launched cloud services um, within uh, Byte uh, out to our client base. Um, we traditionally resell uh, Azure and vCloud Air as uh, two topics uh, for our organization, but more recently, we provide our own infrastructure as a service, VR as a service and backup as a service, out of two data centers in um, Slough and London, that's Telehouse and Equinix. One of the benefits of utilizing those data centers is they give the capability of utilizing express route to Azure for extra or elastic uh, computing, uh, but also have the ability to uh, burst into um, iSoft and also the uh, Google and AWS uh, platforms too. But I want to draw your attention really to the on-prem uh, data center uh, offering and, and portfolio that we, we now provide as, a, as an organization. Uh, we provide end-to-end -end, uh, uh, infrastructure, so that's everything from the hypervisor layer down to the back end, uh, and with that we work with uh, sort of the mainstream uh, vendors in the market uh, thus far. So the purpose really from, from this, uh, this session that we're going to cover today is talking about Flash and the drive for Flash and why people are now uh, actively and uh, aggressively looking at Flash as a, as a uh, proposition for, to, to replace their, their current storage platform. Some of the drivers we see in the market are all about sort of reducing cost uh, from a power cooling perspective and footprint perspective in data centers. Uh, as the cost uh, increases, um, that draws uh, challenges for, for organizations as a whole. So that's one of the demands we're seeing. And also the workloads and application demands uh, from a performance perspective are now driving uh, the, the requirement for, from a flash perspective too. Uh, and if you believe uh, some of the uh, sort of the, the larger marketing organizations like Gartner and IDC in the market, uh, they believe come 27, 2018, Flash storage will be your tier one um, platform for uh, applications and SaaS technology will eventually go end of life. So on that note, I'd like to pass over to Max. Uh, Max is um, a systems engineer from uh, based in the UK for, for Pure and he'll give you a, a better understanding of uh, where Pure fits in the market uh, and why they've been so successful uh, thus far. Thank you for that, Stuart. Uh, let me just bring my screen up. All right, hopefully everyone can see the slides now. So yes, uh, thank you once again for joining. Thank you, uh, the guys at Bytes. So, you know, I thought I'd introduce Pure Storage. I'm not going to assume that everybody knows exactly who we are and what we do. And I thought I'd set the scene in terms of all flash arrays and SSDs and kind of where the market's going. So I think, you know, when you look at things that happen in IT, um, every now and then you have something extremely disruptive that happens. You know, if you look, if you think back to the days of VMware, 
that's possibly one of the most disruptive things that's happened in IT in a long while, you know, through the migration of physical to virtual machines, do more with less, etc. I also thought I'd bring up this picture. So this is um, the CEO of Netflix, a guy called Reed Hastings, looking through the window of a blockbuster video store. So, you know, obviously, as you know, Netflix won the war in terms of, you know, the online presence. Blockbuster could have easily seized this market, but they did not see the disruption that was coming. Um, you know, Blockbuster were well positioned to be the leaders in this market. They sat back, they didn't see what was coming, and Netflix are where they are today. Similar thing is kind of happening in IT. So we've had virtualization, which has, you know, as I said, completely changed the landscape of data centers. We've got cloud, you know, people that are putting more data out into the cloud, they're using some of the cloud things as a service. And then if you look at Moore's Law, where, you know, compute, networking, CPU, RAM, etc., has got faster and faster. But the one thing that hasn't changed over the last 13 years is disk. <clears throat> so if you look at the fastest disk available today, it's the 15K spindle. That was invented in 2001, and it hasn't changed at all. Now, if disk had followed Moore's Law, then the drives today would be spinning at 1.2 million RPM, but they're not. So in essence, you've got your data centers with relatively new technology, the latest gadgets and features being underpinned by technology that is 13 years old. Well, that's all going to change because now SSDs are becoming slightly more affordable, but not affordable for everyone. But flash is the answer to all of these problems. But how have people been trying to solve um, the, the flash situation? So there have been some attempts to do flash in different formats, in different guises. You know, if we take the one at the top, so you know, the disk caching or tiering. So this is where you're using SSD as an acceleration layer or as a caching layer or maybe as a tier. So hot blocks move up and down the stack. But that's just kind of a sticking plaster to a situation that's trying to fix part of the solution, but not all of it. You've also had what we call array retrofits, where you have your existing storage array with SAS drives and SATA drives, and then you just put SSDs in and kind of hope for the best, which ultimately, it kind of works for some people, but not really, because it's not been designed. You know, If you're going to use SSDs, you need to design a new architecture to work with it. And then you've got the flash appliances, you know, these 1U bespoke servers full of stranger memory dims that act as storage but kind of look like memory. And then you've got your individual um, HBAs or cards, the acceleration cards you can put in individual servers, but then that doesn't really scale too well. So, you know, the approach that Pure have got is, you know, what if flash could be everyday storage instead of being used for just that tier zero, high frequency, low latency trading application? What if you could deploy flash for all of your VMs, all of your virtual desktops, all of your databases? What if it was just simpler, like a utility? You know, if I use the analogy of, of water and taps in your house, you turn on the tap, the water comes out, you don't need to care where it's come from and what the pressure is, it's just there as a utility. But also, there's other things to do, it's not just about the technology, it's about building a better storage company and uh, doing the right things by our customers. So if we uh, kind of track back as to who Pure are, so we were founded in 2009, um, you know, the kind of people that are on our board of investors and <coughs> initial funders, such as Diane Green and Mendel Rosenblum, who founded VMware, Frank Slootman, who was the founder of Data Domain and is now the CEO of ServiceNow, as well as a whole plethora of other um, industry uh, luminaries. In terms of investment, you know, we are a pre-IPO company. Um, I think we're called more of an upstart than a startup. But to date, we've had nearly half a billion dollars worth of funding. And as well as that funding coming from the traditional likes of your Silicon Valley venture capitalist, we've also had significant investment from people such as Samsung, who actually are one of our larger customers. Um, we've had investment from people like Fidelity, who are actually putting long-term strategic bets on Pure in terms of pension funds, rather than VCs that really have pretty much a seven-year window to get their money in and then get it out again. As it stands, the company has over 1,000 employees. We're in about 28 countries globally. We've got close to 300 partners. We've got well over 1,000 customers, um, about two, two and a half thousand arrays deployed. In terms of support, so the way we've designed our support is that our support guys sit with engineering. They're not remote from engineering. So when you phone our support or you contact our support, we don't have the usual entitlement, then level one, then level two, then level three. The person that you speak to would be the equivalent of a level three support engineer. He knows exactly what your array is doing, he knows what your problem could be, and if he's stuck, then he sits with engineering and they're straight there to help. We also decided that as a company we need to do things differently. We need to be ethical in the way that we do business with customers. 
So sometimes it's the simple things. We don't have any software licensing. We don't have any mandated end user training or professional services. What we do though is look to partners such as Bytes to wrap around a service around the pure. So it isn't just always the rack stack, turn it on and here's some storage. It's the integration into your, you know, your Windows environments, your VMware environments, you know, configuration of your switches and zoning, etc. And I'll talk about Love Your Storage and Forever Flash in a few moments. So in terms of what the analysts say about us, you know, Garner are still the leading independent uh, analyst in the storage arena. And if we look at the magic quadrant, I mean, it's a bit of a Marmite thing. Some people stand by what they say and some CEOs and CTOs make decisions based on it. Other people don't think they're worth the paper they're written on. But personally, you know, Gartner still are the largest independent. Now, what you find with this slide is ordinarily, and I've worked for quite a few startups in the past, and what you find is the, the new players, the pre-IPOs, the startups generally tend to be in the bottom half of the box. So they may have great completeness of, of vision, but ability to execute the top half of the quadrant is generally reserved for the big boys, the big name players. As you can see, we're in this box, and we're pretty close with uh, EMC and close-ish to IBM. But a company with a thousand employees has been ranked on its ability to execute with companies that have tens if not hundreds of thousands of employees. And this is testament to the quality of what we're doing. So not only do we say we can do, you know, we say this is what we can do, we can actually deliver on that as well. So where do Pure play? So we are a block-based array. We present Fiber Channel and we present iSCSI. We are not a unified storage solution. We do not do NAS or NFS or SIFS out of the box. We present raw storage to servers that they would then see as raw devices and format as drives, LUNs, etc. So there was another Gartner report called the Critical Capabilities, which ranks a whole host of vendors in terms of are you good at databases, are you good at video streaming, are you good at archive data? And these are the three areas where, where you know where we squarely focus and where we come out top every time. So OLTP, any type of database, from SQL to Oracle to Ingress to MongoDB to whatever it is through to server virtualization, anything from VMware to Hyper-V to Zen Server, and then VDI, whether it's VMware or Citrix or, or something using Windows. And again, these are, these are the areas where we play the best, and this is where we kind of squarely fit. So we are looking at replacing tier one enterprise storage disk. So anything that you're running today on 10K or 15K spindles is an instant fit for Pure. So in a few words, what is Pure? So I like to use the a acronym of ASAP. So Admittedly, we are a flash array, 100% flash, but I'm going to talk about performance last because I don't think that is the key thing we should be looking at when you're looking at an all flash array. What we're really looking at here is a new breed of storage. So when Pure sat down with a blank sheet of paper, they come up with a few things and said, well, what should we do to design not just a flash array, let's design the best storage array on the planet, but we're going to build it around flash because that is the future. Spinning disk is just so old, it's just it's not viable to use these days for performance-based applications. So number one, our key aim is availability. Now, I know that many vendors will say that they have zero downtime on their arrays, and what they mean by that is that if you have a component failure, or you need to do some kind of scheduled maintenance, whether it's swapping drives or doing a firmware upgrade, you will have zero downtime. What they actually mean is the array itself won't go offline, but your performance will suffer. I mean, this is the reason why I've not yet met a customer who will do a firmware upgrade on their production array in the daytime, unless you're running it on Pure, obviously. So what we've moved towards and what we've actually designed and have had as you know, our mantra since day one is to have close to six nines uptime and a non-disruptive operational approach. In other words, if I'm failing drives as part of a test or if drives fail, which is extremely rare, or if controllers are being replaced, if controllers are being rebooted, if firmware is being upgraded, I do not want it to have any impact on my business. I do not want any downtime, which is obvious, but more importantly, I don't want any performance loss. So to be honest, if your array is incredibly simple, and it's really cheap, and it's really fast, but every time you need a firmware upgrade, it goes down, or when a drive fails, it runs 50% slower, or if a controller fails, you've lost half your write cache and bad things happen, it's pointless, right? So what you need is a system that literally is either running to the best of its ability or you've completely turned it off. There's no gray area of, of you know, if this thing happens or that thing happens, things will go slow. Simplicity is the next thing. Now, I'm sure every vendor says their technology is simple. No one's going to stand up and say, you know, it's really complex. 
But when you find that there are no installation services that we have a part number for, there are no end user training courses. Admittedly, there's an eight minute video on YouTube and that's all you need to know. So it is as intuitive to use as you know, a smartphone of today's technology. And then affordability. <clears throat> Again, you can't have something that's gonna be fantastic that costs $10 million. So the way we you know, reduce the cost of our storage is number one, the hardware that we use is standard commodity x86. It's the intelligent software that we've designed that turns a couple of standard x86 servers into some very intelligent storage controllers. And then the drive shelves that we use are standard ones that are used by many other vendors. We also get the cost down by selling you physically less capacity than you need. So through data reduction techniques, such as pattern removal, uh, zero pattern matching, uh, data uh, sorry, deduplication and compression, this means that we could be selling you you know, three times, four times, five times, six, ten times less data than you actually need because we don't store multiple copies of the data and any, copy, and any, individ, any unique data that we do store gets compressed. We also don't have software licensing. You know, this is why customers love buying from Pure. This is why partners love dealing with Pure because a quote will just say, that's the cost of the hardware, that's the cost of support. Everything is included. Anything new that comes out, replication, encryption, um, you know, single pane of glass management, whatever it is, is free of charge and just gets included as a firmware upgrade. And we have extremely flat support costs, which I'm gonna go into more detail on. And then lastly, there's performance. So yes, we are fast, we're 100% flash, but the key thing is, it's about giving you that 100% performance all of the time, regardless of the type of workload. Now, a lot of storage arrays have a kind of fixed architecture where they might be really good doing VDI because it's small block size, but when they try to do uh, a SQL uh, analytics job that may have a 64K block size, suddenly the performance drops and your latencies will spike. We've designed ours to handle any type of workload all of the time. So there's no problem with mixing and matching workloads such as you know, small block VDI, large block SQL, uh, medium sized block VMware, all on the same rate at the same time with no ill effects. So in terms of the ROI with Pure, I mean two things to obviously look at with any purchase. There's your CapEx and your OpEx. So obviously the CapEx is what you pay up front. With traditional spinning disk, what you buy is not what you get. So, you know, very simple maths. You put five drives in a RAID 5, you've lost a drive's worth of capacity. Now, if you multiply that out to a large array, and if you look at a big 42U rack of disk, that means that probably 25 to 30% of the spindles in there aren't actually things that you could use because of the RAID overhead. Conversely, with Pure, it's the opposite way around. So, what you pay up front um, actually gets you more. Because of the dedupe and the compression, you're actually getting more storage than we physically sold you. So there's the kind of CapEx argument. But then more importantly, there's the OpEx argument. So if for once we just assume that the yearly cost of maintenance is the same between both vendors, which it won't be after three years, but I'll come on to that. If you then look at power, space, and management, you know, we are constantly reducing uh, customers' footprints from you know, uh, traditionally a rack of spinning disk that takes up about eight to nine kilowatts. We can replace that with a quarter of a rack of pure taking up just over one kilowatt. So we're reducing your power by a factor of eight, we're you know, decimating your footprint by a factor of four. And then from a management perspective, if instead of spending hours a week managing your storage and having loads of different colored spreadsheets trying to work out what drives are in what LUNs or aggregates or volumes, etc., you just have one pool of storage that's very easy to administer, then suddenly your management goes down from hours to minutes. And we've sold a lot of pure arrays into customers where they had no storage skills whatsoever. So in terms of the TCO and the long-term gain that you can get from Pure, from Pure, let's just look at what happens with your traditional big storage vendors. So let's say um, you go to vendor, whoever it is, and you buy an array with three years support and you possibly get quite a good deal for the first three years. Then towards the end of year three, you ask for a quote for support for years four and five. And what you'll find is the cost of that support is astronomical. This is because that vendor wants to sell you a brand new storage array. So you've got two choices. You either pay a huge amount for maintenance, which isn't really worth it because now you're paying a huge amount to support something that is already three years old and possibly running on 13-year-old disk technology, or you buy a brand new array, which you then put next to your old array 
So now you're running two arrays, two lots of management, two lots of configuration. You've got the data migration. Not only that, but you may need extra switch ports. You've got to do more zoning. If you're in a colo, this is going to cost you, you know, extra kilowatt hours or an extra floor tile. It's just a painful way of doing business that everyone has done before. Now, the way that Pure answer this is with something that we call Forever Flash, and there are three aspects to this. So number one, our support costs never, ever go up. So what you pay in year one, two, three is the same in four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The only time that your support cost will go up on a pure array is when you actually buy more capacity, because there's obviously more um, capacity hardware. But apart from that, if you never upgraded, if you never upgraded storage, your cost would never go up. Then also to add to this, at the end of year three, if you then choose to extend your support with Pure, we will replace your controllers with the brand new uh, technology for free. And this maintenance, sorry, this controller upgrade can be done with zero downtime and more, more importantly, no loss of performance. The easiest way to kind of explain what we do, we're very much like, I guess you could say, a phone contract. You know, everyone knows the end of your two, at the end of your two-year contract, you go back to your phone provider and you say, I want a new deal. Chances are you may get a cheaper deal or you may get the same deal but possibly get more data in your tariff, but you know you're going to get brand new hardware without even asking for it. And that's exactly what we do. So that is our approach, that it is the controllers that are the brains and the key to everything in an all-flash array. So at the end of year three, you get new hardware. You will never have to come to Pure and say, I need to buy new controllers because my other ones are old. That's not what happens with us. And then lastly, the forever maintenance. We don't care how old your SSDs are. If they fail in year three, year four, if they fail in year nine, year 10, we will replace them free of charge. I think if you compare that to, I would say, almost all other vendors in the market that are selling flash arrays or SSDs for standard storage arrays, they either have a five-year or a seven-year life. And after that point, they will not support them. In other words, if they fail, you have to buy a brand new one. For us, if you have a support contract, we support absolutely everything you've got forever. What we like to do with every customer is to do a proof of concept because you know these slides are going to look great, a demo will look great, and you can get your hands on and you will see it's good. But the best uh, way to test this is to have it in your environment, put copies of your data on, try your tests in your own time. And you know we can get you kit within five to seven days and we'd love you to test it to pieces. If you can't do that, we offer a love your storage guarantee. So if you don't get the dedupe that we said you'd get, the performance, resiliency, simplicity, support, whatever it is, if you don't get what you said, um, you know, we said you'd get, we'll just take it back, no questions asked. But to be honest, nine times out of 10, customers will do a proof of concept, and about 70% of the time, the arrays never come back. They stay in the customer's data centers because they see exactly what it does for them. So let's just talk about just two uh, publicly referenceable case studies we've got and how it's improved their business. So for companies such as Betfair, I mean everything, you know, this is all about time and you know, time to market and kind of saving money. So for these guys, um, what they would do is every night they would take an entire copy of their production array, uh, sorry, of their production environment, which was about 400 virtual machines, close to 200, 200 applications, about 100 databases. They would take a complete clone of that, and then they would use that to analyze what games customers are playing online, who's playing, you know, what games are being played the most, how can they change the odds. Then they would revise that for the next morning because for these guys, it was all about client retention and getting people to stay on the site because the average lifespan of a customer on a gaming site is about six weeks. If you can increase that, it's an easy way to increase your revenue. This six-hour job is now done in 40 minutes on Pure. So this means that they can now do as many iterations in a day as they could do in a week. So they can react so much quicker to the market that their client retention has now gone up dramatically. In addition, um, from a simplicity perspective, they've now got their cloud team managing it. So initially, the cloud team managed their, you know, it's managing their internal cloud, but would have to talk to the storage team and say, please, can you provision this? Please, can you give me um, the storage that I need? They now manage it themselves because it is that easy to do. They don't have to worry about aggregates and flex files and RAIDs and LUNs and all that. They just have one pool of storage and they can present that out as volumes. Now, as a result of being so successful in the testing dev environment, we've now moved on to their core gaming exchange. So Betfair are running Europe's largest Oracle database, and that is 100% running on Pure. We also have Investec Asset Management. 
So again, for these guys, they had the issues, they had the noisy neighbor. Every time they did a backup job, it ruined their um, Exchange and BlackBerry server performance and nobody could get email. Um, you know, you can see the business results they had of Pure. So everything's down to sub-millisecond latency. This means they can have four times as many portfolio managers, which basically means four times as much investment, which for these guys is an instant addition to their bottom line revenue. We've reduced the space in their racks by 70%, so their power and colo costs have gone down. And as you can see, they're going to save $40,000 over three years, purely down to power consumption reductions. You know, this is just extra free money. And as a result, Investec have gone 100% all flash in their data center. There's one small area of email archive that isn't really suitable for flash, but apart from that, everything is residing on pure. So I'm just going to go into um, a little bit of a deep dive into the technology. So, you know, why would you want to go all flash? I guess the way to turn this question around is why wouldn't you go all flash and why doesn't every vendor offer an all flash array? And I think the simple answer to that is that most vendors haven't worked out how to do an all flash array at a cost that is acceptable to many customers with uh, features, you know, with new features or enterprise class features that you've come to expect. So, you know, you have your traditional disk arrays that have cache in the controllers, but ultimately you're still bound by what the disk spindles can do. You've got your hybrid arrays, which use SSDs as a cache acceleration layer. So what you're hoping is that 80 or 90% of your IOs will be serviced out of the SSD caching layer. But this still means that 10 to 20% 10 to of your IOs are going to come from something that could be 20 to 30 times slower. So it's still like the weakest link. If I'm running a report to see what customers did last week, that's great. But what about when I need to run reports that look back last month, last year, or you know the hot blocks have now gone cold, suddenly you're going to be getting very slow performance. With Pure, we're all flash, so everything you're getting is coming off SSDs at pretty much sub-millisecond latency. So if from the simplicity side of Pure, I mean, you know, this again was one of the uh, reasons we came into BIM, was that the founders of the company, that some of them, you know, the, one of the guys was the technical founder and CTO of Veritas Software, and he said, right, if I'm going to, you know, design a Pure storage array, I want to make sure that everything that's annoyed me over the last 20 to 30 years in storage, we're going to remove. So number one. There is no more um, setting and managing and worrying about RAID. Yes, we have mechanisms designed to protect you against any kind of failure, but I don't want to have this RAID 5, RAID 10, RAID 6 argument and trade-off. There's also the host and the array block alignment. So if I design a disk array on a fixed architecture of 8K, that means my application should be 8K. My database should be 8K. What if it wants a different what if my application wants to read or write different block sizes? Well you're going to get performance spikes. So let's get rid of that. What about performance bottlenecks? What about the noisy neighbor? You know, if workload B goes bananas, what happens to workload A? Does it impact them? You know, in, a, in a service provider environment, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen. Then customer B affects customer A. So again, we've designed our technology to pretty much remove most of that. And let's not have any tuning and tweaking. Let's not have customers working out how they're going to apportion their data. You know, there are no knobs and dials to tweak and tune with a pure array. And if you are having a RAID rebuild because a drive's failed, it shouldn't have it, number one, it should have no impact on performance, and number two, it should be rebuilding in a handful of minutes, you know, 10 to 20 minutes, not days. And there are no tiers of storage. It's just one tier, and it's very low latency and very easy to use. So our product range is as follows. We have three arrays, the 405, 420, and 450. Really, um, easiest way to look at that, small, medium, large. They all do exactly the same thing. The only difference between them is the amount of capacity that each array can support and the upper level of their IOPS performance. But apart from that, it's identical software. And as I mentioned, all the software is included free. Now, ordinarily, when you look at this, you may think, well, how do I go from the small to the medium to the large? It looks like a forklift upgrade because they are physically separate units. Well, that's not how we've approached this. We said, yes, we want to have an architecture that looks like a traditional storage array with two controllers and shelves of drives. But in terms of the migration process, because of the way we've designed our architecture, and you know, long story short, we don't have write cache in the controllers. Our write cache lives external to the controllers. It lives in the drive shelves themselves. So this means that we can actually physically remove a controller from a running environment and it has no impact on performance whatsoever. If you remove a controller from any other storage array, you will lose half of your write cache, you will not be in a good place to be, and you will have performance issues, and your data could be at risk. That is completely not the way we've designed Pure. 
So if I want to go from the 405 to the 420 to the 450, you just take out a controller, you put in a bigger one, you cable it up and run it, and when you're happy that it's working well, you then take out the other controller and put another larger one in. And we've designed all of our future products to be non-disruptive. So you will never get left on a piece of pure technology that cannot be migrated online with no disruption to the next generation of pure storage. This also goes hand in hand with our forever flash maintenance in terms of every three years we give you new hardware. So it isn't a case of at the end of year three you've got new controllers but you need to turn it all off to swap them. We give you brand new controllers and an engineer will come out and do the swap for you with no disruption, zero downtime and no hit on performance either. So in terms of performance, there's kind of something we like to um, kind of draw to your attention is that most vendors have what I would call their 0 to 60 time on their data sheets. So they will show the fastest performance they can get under an ideal workload or should I say a, an unrealistic workload. So most vendors will quote performance that matches exactly what they do with their block size. So they may quote figures on 4K or 8K you know, random read IOs, which isn't something that anyone does. So if we look at all of the arrays that we've got, because every pure array dials home every 30 seconds, it drops a load of metrics into our database, and we can see exactly what the block size is. And as you can see from the chart on the right-hand side, the amount of pure customers that are doing less than, you know, doing between you know, 1 and 10K block size is about 3%. If we look at the amount of customers that are doing anything from kind of 20 to 30 to 40 to 50k block sizes, that is the vast majority. In fact, I think our average I.O. size is now about 50k rather than 40, as it says on this slide. So we've actually optimized our array to deal with real-world variable I.O. Um, block sizes. So whatever I.O. size comes in, we handle it as one I.O. rather than as multiple. So this is very key. You know, most customers are doing SQL with a 64k block size. VMFS tends to default to uh, 32k block size. It's something like VDI, that's one of the few things that will actually use a small block size. But again, we're optimized to handle any block size. So as I mentioned, you know, we have an always-on architecture. You know, the array is either running to the best of its ability or you've completely turned it off. There really isn't a gray area where it can go slower if you do this or if that happens. So well, there's two ways of looking at this. We have what we call flash recover. These are our internal mechanisms to protect your data against, I guess you could say, human error or you know, application error. So we have uh, up to 5,000 snapshots you can take uh, in the array. They aren't limited on a per volume or per LUN basis. So 5,000 snapshots in the array. The key thing is with us is, as you take a snapshot, obviously, you know, with every array on the planet, when you take a snapshot, it's just pointers. After you've taken the snapshot, we just store the delta changes. But again, any delta changes that we store are deduplicated and compressed. So our snapshots will, take in, will be taken up you know, exponentially less space than you would on a traditional storage array. But also, because of our non-blocking architecture and our variable block size architecture, the more snaps you take will not affect performance. With uh, other storage arrays that are doing copy on write or even redirect on write, the more snaps you take, the more it will affect performance. You can also replicate to another pure array. So, you know, we can do replicas every 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you choose. So we have asynchronous replication, but again, it's free of charge. It's not something we charge you for. It's already there. It's built into the array. And we have lots of protection policies built in to work out, do I want to protect one volume? Do I want to create a consistency group based on five or six volumes? Or do I want to protect all of the volumes that are, protected, that are presented to my VMware cluster? And then you've got Flash Protect, which is the orange box. So this is more around kind of the hardware side of things. So if you look at any traditional storage array today, if I want to upgrade the hardware or I need to replace it because there's been an issue, will my performance be affected? Well, yeah, definitely. If, you're getting, if you've got spinning drives and you pull one out, you've got a RAID rebuild. That will impact performance. It's a given because of the amount of reads and writes and parity calculations that are going on. With Pure when a drive is removed and we encourage every customer in a proof of concept to try and break the array. So when you take a drive out or take a couple of drives out in each shelf, the performance doesn't change. If you fail a controller, there's about a five to six second pause and then the whole array resumes at a hundred percent performance. There is no kind of, I've lost half my write cache, I'm going to go slow. Also software upgrades, I mean this is more regular. So rather than things failing on a regular basis, possibly, well, for some customers it does fail on a regular basis, 
but more, more likely you're going to be doing maintenance upgrades or firmware upgrades. And customers are happy to do more firmware upgrades with Pure because we release new features, because the software is free, and also because once they've done one of them, they realize that actually this has no impact on performance. I've got a couple of customers. I've got one ISP that did an upgrade recently about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I've got another customer, a law firm with a heavy VDI environment. They upgraded their array with 1,500 virtual desktops, and they did it at 10 o'clock on a Friday morning with no impact and no, uh, you know, no impact on the end users, no performance hit, etc. So it is about if I have failure, there is no loss on performance. And then lastly, there is you know, dual parity data protection. So we don't have traditional RAID 6, which is what you think of with dual parity. Um, we have a pseudo RAID 6 algorithm, but it's under the covers. We virtualize all the storage. We don't reserve entire drives for RAID sets. That's not how we work. We kind of create these very small um, RAID stripes that are less than 100 meg in size, and they get striped across all of the drives, so all of the flash is being evenly warm. We also have always-on encryption, so as the data comes into the array, not only do we dedupe it and compress it in line, we also encrypt it. So we're also doing data integrity checks as the data comes in, once it resides on disk, and when we take the data back out to present it to a host, we also check the data integrity. So we're always checking that the data is good and so that we actually don't lose data or end up with corrupted data. So I guess you know, the key thing to take away from this slide, which is slightly wordy, there's a lot of things going on, it's that box at the bottom right, the flash personality layer. It is about understanding how SSDs work. So we understand the fingerprint of an SSD, we understand how to write to it. One of the key things with an SSD is you can't just put an SSD into a standard storage array and hope that it will work. Because if you don't, uh, then you're going to have issues like garbage collection, which could cause massive performance spikes. If you're not writing to the SSD in the most optimal way, you can end up, I guess what you could say, punching holes in it, which will cause more issues. In fact, will cause something called write amplification, which is a very bad side effect of using an SSD. What you need to do is something that we do, and again, this is because we understand SSD, that box top in the middle that says flash geometry aligned writes, we understand the size of the erase block in an SSD. So when we're writing to an SSD, we always match this thing called the arrays block, which means we don't leave blocks with half good data and half bad data, which if we did do that, would mean that we would cause a lot of write amplification because the good data has to get rewritten to a new location in order to wipe or refresh the bad data or the stale data. So we're massively minimizing write amplification, which means the length of the drives is increased, which means we get better performance, and in addition, because of dedupe and compression, we're writing a lot less data anyway. We also have a non-blocking architecture. So the simple way to explain this is that we never read and write to the same SSD at the same time. By doing this, we're pretty much avoiding the noisy neighbor. You know, if uh, an application needed to read a block of data from a drive that's already being written to, it would not be allowed to access that drive to read from it. What it would do is look at the data and the parity bits from the other drives and calculate what that block should be. And that calculation is done in the same amount of time as the original read would be. And as a data integrity exercise, we do this reading, we do the reading of the data from the parity about 20% of the time anyway, just to check that the data on the SSDs is actually good. So we're doing a lot of um, clever things behind the scenes to make sure that we minimize write amplification, which we've almost um, negated. We minimize uh, the noisy neighbor because we never read and write to drives at the same time. We're evenly wearing the flash. And the garbage collection algorithms are all done at a global level by our controllers, rather than letting 24, 48, or 100 or so individual drives each do garbage collection as and when they feel like it. We let our controllers do it at a global, holistic level. So in terms of the data reduction, there are kind of five key things we do. So number one is pattern removal. So as the data comes into the array, if we see the same repeating patterns, like if we see a million zeros, we don't write them down to disk. So hence, if you're using VMware, we recommend that you use eager zero thick for your VMDK format, because when you tell us to write a million zeros, we don't. We just put a, a kind of a notifier in our metadata database that, there, that says there should be a million zeros starting at this logical block address. We also do pattern removal in terms of if we get a 512 byte block of data and with the same repeating pattern that might go 123, 123, et cetera, we don't write that over and over again. We also do inline deduplication. So as that 512 byte block of data comes in, if we spot 
that we already have it because we do a checksum and check in our metadata database for that same checksum if we have it. We then compare it with the data byte for byte on the array. If it's the same, then we update the metadata base and don't write it down to the SSD. So then we're left with unique blocks of data. So these are the 512 byte blocks of data that we've never seen before. We then compress them and then gather them together into these small miniature RAID segments and flush them to the SSDs at the back end. Then after that, we actually do additional data reduction. So we do pattern removal, dedupe and compression in line. We then do deeper reduction. So if we have some spare CPU cycles on the array, we will go around and we will uh, apply some different compression algorithms. We have about five or six different levels of compression and we can actually get more aggressive if time permits, if the array is slightly quieter. So for example, if you do a proof of concept, put some data on pure on day one and then don't touch it for 24 or 48 hours, you'll find that your data reduction will have got better because of this post-process additional deeper reduction that we do. In addition to this, we have zero cost snapshots. So the snapshots that you take, we track the delta changes, but obviously the only changes that we will track will be brand new, unique data block changes. Then if you look at clones or things like using Xcopy with VMware, so when you tell a pure array to clone a virtual machine, whether that virtual machine is 20 gig or two terabytes, it's done in a couple of seconds because all we are doing is updating metadata database tables. It is physically impossible for a pure array to copy a piece of data. We never store the same block of data more than once. So this is why customers would use, would create more clones than they would ordinarily, have more copies of databases, etc., without any impact on production. So depending on your data set, we do get uh, a varied range of data reduction. So in a database environment, it's probably about three to four to one data reduction. But if you are taking multiple copies and clones of that database, then it will go up. If you go right to the other end of the scale with virtual desktops, we see anything from uh, eight to one up to about 20 to one data reduction, because obviously desktops all look the same. <clears throat> so it's key to point out that we do deduplication and compression. A lot of the other all flash vendors or a lot of the hybrid array vendors tend to do either deduplication or compression, but not both. So if you look at this, you can see the difference between the orange and the blue bars into what workloads are suitable for compression and what workloads are suitable for deduplication. And as you can see on the left hand side, you know, databases, they are much better at being compressed. An individual database will compress well, but there won't be much dedupe in it, unless, as I said, you have multiple copies of the same database. If you go to the other end of the scale with um, VDI and virtual desktops and multiple clones, then deduplication obviously plays a much bigger part because you've got hundreds or thousands of images that all look the same. And then somewhere in the middle, you've got your virtual infrastructure, which is roughly almost a 50-50 split between dedupe and compression. The fact of the matter is that because Pure does both dedupe and compression, we don't care what your workload is. You know, so mixed workloads we're very good at. Some vendors will say, we've got an array and it's great for VDI. We've got an array, it's great for databases, which is no good being a corner case. We want to be, uh, you know, we are an array that is great for consolidating all of your tier one enterprise workloads onto Pure because we do dedupe and compression and we don't care what your block size is. So we fit all of your environments. So in terms of, you know, where we fit, again, you know, virtual environments, virtual server environments, private cloud environments, which ultimately is going to revolve around some kind of um, virtualized infrastructure. And, you know, the great phrase that VMware coined was the IO blender because suddenly you've got ESX servers handling all kinds of crazy block sizes from small block VDI to large block SQL, but it's all virtualized through VMware. Also, for us, we don't care what the workloads are. You know, we can virtualize. We're happy with all of these being virtualized, whether it's small blocks or large blocks. You can scale the system out very simply. You either add capacity until you get to a point where you've reached the capacity of that specific pure model at that point when you buy a new shelf of capacity and you upgrade to the next larger controller, we do not charge for controller upgrades if you're buying extra capacity. So let's say you had a 420 with uh, six shelves, or sorry, with four shelves and you needed shelf number five, we would, you know, you obviously you'd buy shelf number five, but we would give you the controllers for the next larger array free of charge. And as I mentioned earlier, replacement of those, those controllers is done online with zero disruption. If you want to automate any of the task built in, we have integration with uh, VCOPS, which I think has now changed its name to something, vRealize Operations. Um, 
but we also have REST APIs, we've got CLI, obviously we have a GUI, we've got extensive PowerShell commandlets, so it's very easy to automate this. Uh, we've got an OpenStack Cinder driver, so we can plug into that for the automation of the storage. And you know, it's very efficient to use. We're going to reduce the amount of power, cooling, uh, the space saving, and also the management. From a VDI perspective, you know, you need to be given a performance from a, for a virtual desktop, which is similar to that of a local desktop with an SSD in it. So you need to have hundreds of thousands of IOPS ready to go. You also need to be able to handle the peak workloads. So when you know, you'll find that between probably 8:30 and 10 is your peak workload when customers are logging off. Similarly, on a Friday, that will be, be a same workload issue. There could be a virus scan that kicks off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. On a normal disk array, that would absolutely bring it to its knees, and that's not what you want. You want an environment where you know, the tests have shown that we can boot 100 virtual desktops in 22 seconds. We can recompose 1,000 virtual machines in about 40 minutes. And you also, you, know, you also want to not have to make these decisions, which you would do normally with spinning disk in terms of, do I go for fully persistent and fat desktops, or do I go for much thinner linked clones? You know, there's a trade-off between the two. For us, it makes no difference. Persistent desktop versus linked clones, it's all the same to us, because we don't store the same block of data over and over. From a performance perspective, again, there's no difference. So it's very simple to just roll one of these out. You may decide that your IT, your IT support staff and senior members of staff have a fully persistent desktop, and your standard ordinary office workers um, have link clones. Again, it's up to you how you want to design it. It's not a case that the storage is influencing your decision. And we have plugins into vSphere, so you can manage all of this through, uh, through the vSphere web client and not really have to touch the pure GUI. And lastly, from a database perspective, so I generally find in my job that I come across two types of DBA. Those that don't care about storage, they just literally phone their support desk and say, please can I have some more storage, or can you make it go faster, and that's it. Then you have the other DBAs that spend a long time worrying about the storage, and they want to make sure that the block size of the array matches the block size of their database, and matches the block size of their application. They may be requesting that their logs are on RAID 10 and their database files are on RAID 5. They might be asking what the stripe width or the, the depth of the stripe depth of the array is or the LUNs. Well, all of that's gone with Pure because we don't care what the block size is. We don't care if you want to write to raw devices or a file system. If you want to use one LUN or many LUNs, again, it makes no difference for us. We don't have to load balance across multiple LUNs for things like iSCSI portal connectivity. RAID, don't worry about RAID. You never set RAID on a Pure. We protect you in the background. There's no decisions to make. There's no worry about caching or tiering or hot blocks being in the wrong place at the wrong time or you know, hot blocks being on cold storage. If you need to grow the LUNs, it is a case you press one button to make it larger and pure. You extend it at the file system layer, and it's all done online. From a snapshot perspective, because you know, even from a database clone perspective, because we never store the same block of data more than once, you could now have a huge amount of more copies of your database than you would have had before, which obviously means your development times are much shortened. You've got a quicker time to market, and also it won't impact performance of production. And lastly, we can do the compression in the storage. So rather than do it at the, at the uh, server tier or taking up CPU cycles, let us do it. So just coming back to kind of wrap up on you know, what pure storage is. So you know, I use the ASAP acronym. So where did we start with talking about? It's availability. You know, without an array being available, everything else goes out the window. It becomes a pointless exercise. So because we don't store the right cache in the controllers, the right cache lives in the storage shelves themselves. In fact, all of the metadata and all of the configuration lives across the storage devices, the SSDs. The storage controllers themselves have been designed um, to be a stateless architecture. There is nothing important that resides in the controllers. They are just, I guess for want of a better phrase, just I.O. Um, processing engines. So when you remove one of these engines, you don't lose your right cache. You've still got all of your right cache. Your remaining single controller can still see all of that right cache. The performance stays the same. The availability stays the same. There's no risk um, to your business at all. From a simplicity perspective, there is no complexity, no mandated professional services. You know, we let our customers wrap around as an integrated solution, but there is no uh, part number or SKU from Pure that says installation. There is no mandated end user training course. As I said, there's an eight minute video on YouTube. Uh, from affordability, <coughs> hopefully you've seen or you, you know, I've explained about our data reduction techniques, which means that, you know, and it is unmatched, nobody in the business is getting the data reduction that we get, because number one, we do deduplication and compression, and number two, 
our deduplication is done at a 512 byte layer, whereas other people that might dedupe at 8K or 16K, they just don't have that level of granularity. We also don't have any software licensing, so all you're buying is the array and support. Anything we release is free, it's just a firmware upgrade, and our support costs, as I mentioned, they never go up unless you actually buy more capacity. But there is none of that to maintenance extortion at the end of three years. There is no need to buy a new array because we're going to charge you so much money. And in fact, it's the, it's the absolute, absolutely the opposite, that at the end of year three, if you decide to renew support with Pure, we actually give you free hardware. And given that these are standard x86 commodity architectures, every year we release a new generation of controller because we just take advantage of Intel's R&D cycles. So this will mean in three years' time, you'll get new controllers that will be three generations ahead and will probably support more capacity, be faster, have extra features, and it will have cost you nothing. You know, this is like going from an iPhone 2 to an iPhone 6 or whatever it is. But again, very similar kind of um, concept to your mobile phone contract. Get better deals, get newer technology, and everything kind of stays the same, your data stays in place. And lastly, performance. So yes, it is 100% flash, there is no spinning disk, there's nothing that goes slow in our array, but we handle any type of workload any block size and all the time. And our non-blocking architecture where reads and writes don't trample on each other's toes enables customers to run things like production and test and dev and QA and UAT all on the same array without worrying about having ill effects and taking more copies of their production database for more test and dev. So lastly, you know, the five key differentiators of Pure. So we pretty much guarantee what we say we'll do. If we say you're going to get this dedupe, this level of performance, we'll stand by that. But what most customers love to do, as I mentioned earlier, is do a proof of concept and prove it in their own data center with their own staff running it and their own data that actually it does what we said it would do. All of the software is included. We will never charge you for anything new that comes out. As long as you're under support, you get everything. No training, no installation services, and you know the cloud assist, this is our support. Um, so every 30 seconds, the array dials home. We know exactly what customers are doing. And it's something like 60% of our support cases are initiated by our support guys seeing an issue in your environment or seeing something that, that they could you know, assist you with to do better or doing firmware upgrades for you because they may know that there's a known bug in a certain version of firmware. They'll contact you, they'll check that your array health is good, they'll check that your hosts are multipath correctly, and then they'll go ahead and do the upgrade with zero downtime and no hit on performance. And then lastly, the forever flash. You know, over, uh, you know, if you take your TCO beyond the standard of three years, we are you know, massively less than all of the competition out there because we never charge you more money for support. It stays flat. It is the right model for acquisition. So I've got uh, just a, a few minutes left. I thought what I might take the time out to do is just to uh, show you the GUI very, very quickly. So thank you for bearing with me so far. Hopefully you can see this. So this is the GUI. Uh, someone's just killed my virtual machine that was producing the workload. But as you can see, this is the front page. And I was getting, let me just check if I need to log back in. Right, so this array was cranking out uh, 100,000 IOPS, but as you can see, I think someone's killed my virtual machine, so at the minute it's not doing anything. But this is where you get a real-time update every second of the performance on the array, and also what we're showing here is you know, the historical performance, and I can go back from one hour up to 30 days. We can also see the data reduction that I'm getting, and this is the data reduction just of the benefit of, thin uh, sorry, the benefit of uh, deduplication and compression. This does not include thin provisioning. If I was to include thin provisioning in that number, it goes up a lot. But again, thin provisioning is a bit of a fake number to say that you're saving space. This is really saving space. This is what's happening when the data comes in and get reduced. My volumes is the amount of unique data I've got. My shared space, the dark blue bit, is the amount of data blocks that are referenced by more than one volume. In other words, these are, these are blocks that have been deduped. And I'm only 18% full at the minute. From an administration perspective, there's only two things you need to do. Tell it who your hosts are and tell it how much capacity they should have. So, if I want to create a host, that's all I need to do. Because what I really need to do is, this is just given an entry in a table saying this is the name of a host. What I need to do is tell it what that host is. If my host is Fiber Channel, I'd click on Fiber Channel. And if you've done your zoning correctly, your Fiber Channel worldwide name should appear. You'd select them and click Confirm. Or if you're running iSCSI, you would just type in 
the IQN name of your server and you're done. Chances are you might have a couple of hosts that could be in a cluster. So let's create max host two and you, again you do the host port configuration. What I actually want to do is create, a, you know, if I create volumes, I don't want to have to create a, vo a volume and present it to host one and then remember to present it to host two. What I can do is create a host group. and then add those two hosts into it. So now max host group contains those two and I will provision my storage to the group and not to the individual host. So as we can see, if you look at volumes, obviously I've got 2.8 on data reduction, but you can actually see the data reduction on a per volume basis. So in terms of provisioning storage, there are only two questions we ask. What do you want to call it and how big should it be? There's no questions about, is this going to be for SQL, or is it going to be a log file, or is it going to be for database files, or is it for VMware, what block size do you want, what RAID level do you want, don't need any of that. So let's call it max for 1, let's make it 123 gig, and click create, and as you can see, it's created max file 1, the screen has flipped to, to show max file 1, and it's not connected to anything. So in order to connect it to, in this instance, I want to connect it to my host group, connect host groups to max host group 1, click confirm, and we're done. That is the storage provisioning, and this hopefully shows why we don't have any training courses, because that's it. You don't have to think about anything else. There is no storage configuration you do at initial setup. In fact, the initial setup of a pure array, when it comes out of the factory, is I literally just answer some questions that are based around IP addresses, in terms of what are the IP addresses of the controllers, what's your DNS, what's your proxy, um, what's the uh, email address for alerting, what's the SNMP, etc. So a very, very simple setup. You don't have anything to do with the storage configuration. If I want to do some ad hoc snapshots, it is as simple as create a snapshot and it's done. Then what can I do with these snaps? Well, if I want to present this snapshot to a different server, I just clone it. I make a copy of it. But as I said earlier, we never actually make a copy of anything in Pure. So all this is doing is creating metadata pointers. So I'm going to create a brand new volume based on that point in time snapshot, click create, and you can see the screen has now switched to that volume. What I might do is maybe I just want to connect that to just host two and not host one. Connect it and we're done. And in fact, if I actually deleted or destroyed the original volume, my copy still exists because this is just metadata pointers. We're not moving or copying data around, we're just pointing at things. And in fact, to go a level further, we even have a destroyed volumes bucket. And if I look in here, anything that I destroy will stay in the array for 24 hours before it gets completely eradicated. So I could actually recover that, as long as I'm in with, within the 24-hour time period. So recover a volume, bang, and it's done. We can create schedules for protection. So just to have a quick look at one. As you can see, it's pretty easy to fill in the blanks create a snapshot every X amount of hours, retain them for X amount of days, then do a retention, then have a replication schedule, which could be different, so not only do I want to keep local snapshots, I want to replicate to another array, and then you specify what it is that you actually want to protect. Is it a volume? Is it a host? Is it a host group? Whatever it is. There's further in-depth analysis that will go back anything up to a year, or again one hour or three hours, but you can actually pick the things that you want to analyze, which obviously there's no I.O. going on here. But rather than picking everything, I can see individual items. Same with capacity. So I can see my capacity growth and what's happened to the array. Obviously, this is a demo array, so very little has happened over the last 30 days. But again, you can see what's happened, or I could just look at some individual volumes to see what they've been doing. And then from a system perspective, system health, this is my array. So key thing is, as I hover over these, you can see these are our 256 gig SSDs, where we store the data on this array anyway. But there's some dark gray SSDs on the end. So these are NVRAM drives. This is our write cache. So hopefully this kind of becomes apparent that I've got two controllers that are connected via SAS cables to uh, the shelves at, uh, at the back end. So if controller zero goes offline, because I'm doing a firmware upgrade, Controller 1 will run 100% of the workload and still has access to all four NVRAM drives. So there's never any loss of performance or never any risk of loss to your data. Um, you can see very simply how your hosts are connected. 
So I can see that this host called London ESX has redundant connections. In other words, it has connections to both of the ports on both of the controllers. In fact, if I untick this, it shows me the worldwide uh, names of the ports, so I know which worldwide name is connected to which port. So this is a very quick way to show that is my zoning correct? Do my cables work? Is everything looking good? And lastly, if this hasn't logged me out, we have the vSphere web client. Oh, apologies, I need to log back in. This will just take a couple of seconds, so you can just bear with me. So we have a pure storage plugin over here, which basically shows us all of the data stores that are on the pure. So it doesn't show all the data stores, but only the ones that are on pure. So I can obviously click to them and link through. It also <coughs> paints the pure storage GUI within the vSphere web client. But more useful is actually if we go to the storage area. And what we can see here is the view from VMware. So what we can see is here's what's going on in the array from a pure perspective, the IOPS, the latency, bandwidth, etc. We can see that VMware says there is 306 gigabytes of data in this data store. But on the pure array, there's only 28 gigs. So you can see the difference between what VMware sees and what pure sees. We can actually use this to do <coughs> our data store creation, resize, and deletion. So let's call this max DS15. Let's make it 134 gig. And let's just do create. So this will now go to the array. It will create a, a volume called max DS15. And as you can see, it's done. In fact, if I just change this to all users tasks, you can see it's rescanned, created a VMS data store. So it's created a data store for me. Whoops, okay. vSphere data client's having a bit of a bad day. But then once I've got the data store on there, in fact, if we go to volumes, you can see that there is that data store and it's presented to my London ESX server. From here, we can also destroy the data stores. So destroy pure data store. It will say you're going to reclaim X amount of space. Click destroy. And it will do it in a nice, neat manner. So it will unmount the VMFS volume. It will detach the, uh, the iSCSI LUN from, uh, from VMware. And then it will actually delete the volume in pure. In fact, once the GUI refreshes, bear with me. You'll see there's the test can be deleted. So you can actually see, I still could get it back even if I wanted to. Um, in the new version of vSphere Web Client, we've added a lot more functionality in terms of being able to do snapshots from within the vSphere Web Client. So you can tell the array to take a snapshot. You can add uh, data stores into specific protection groups on the array. You can even configure the multipath into to be the correct uh, parameter for what we need to do. So that's pretty much um, everything from me. Um, if anyone's got any questions, let me just bring up the last slide again. So if anyone has any questions, uh, you know, I'm open up now for if we have any questions. Um, do we have any questions in the chat, chat area? Thanks, Max. Um, yes, we do have a couple of questions. One second, I'm just going to just change it back to myself there. Okay. Okay, so we have a question here from Bob Down, um, who said, okay. do you have any tools to migrate data from an HP 3-pass SAN onto a pure array? Uh, no, so we don't have any specific tools that would assist in the enable of uh, data migration, but what we find um, pretty much all of our customers doing are using host-based tools. So, for example, if you're using VMware, then storage vMotion is you know, the easiest way to do it, and again, you can do this online with no disruption and no downtime to your VMs. Um, if you're running something, uh, I don't know, a Unix environment, then you can use something like logical volume mirroring to just create a, a mirror of the volume and then you know, mirror it to pure, then split the volumes off. Um, other customers have just done a standard backup and restores. So it does depend. Uh, but sometimes this is where we can you know, talk to our partners and see what services we can add around that. But yeah, we don't have a specific data migration tool, but depending on your environment, there are some fairly easy uh, host-based solutions to enable this. Brilliant, thanks Max. Um, so we have a question here from David who's asked, is 10 gigabyte IC 
Oh, sorry, ISCS. Oh, I, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, right, so the support that we do, so in terms of uh, the presentation to the servers, we have 8 gig or 16 gig fiber channel and 10 gig iSCSI. Um, we don't do uh, fiber channel over Ethernet before anyone asks, mainly because we don't see enough demand to actually develop it, to be honest. So it's 8 or 16 gig fiber channel or 10 gig iSCSI. Thanks, Max. Um, so that's all the questions we have. Maybe if we wait um, a minute or so longer. If you do have any questions, just pop those in the questions box. Okay, so Patrick has asked, um, could you confirm what the actual difference between uh, flash and SSD is? Uh, okay, well, no, there isn't a difference. Um, so flash is kind of the generic term to the actually the, the, the kind of modules that live within it. And SSD is a solid state drive, which actually is just, I'll, I'll be blunt, it's a plastic container that holds a load of flash modules. So we talk about all flash arrays rather than all SSD arrays because ultimately in the future, you know, that could change in terms of, you know, will it actually be a two and a half inch drive with flash modules in? Will it be something completely different? But it is a case that um, all flash arrays, you know, a flash is a flash module, an SSD is just literally the drive container that holds them. So, you know, there are some technical experts who would argue that they are different, but ultimately, from our perspective, SSDs, flash, it's pretty much, it is the same thing. Okay, and we have a question from Matthew who's asked, are the 10 gigabyte iSCSI SFP or RJ45? Uh, SFP. Yeah, they're optic, SFP optic. Okay, thanks, Max. We have a few more here. Um, so Glenn has asked, are there any restrictions on the host manufacturer? In particular, are are you host? I'm sorry. In particular, well, so okay, I think I know where you come from. So no, we don't have any restrictions. The only um, restrictions we have are around the operating systems that we support and it's pretty easy for me to say we support pretty much everything that people are using except for things like mainframe, True64, IRIX, you know, really old versions of operating systems that those manufacturers no longer support but otherwise yeah we support pretty much everything that's out there in terms of uh, hardware models of server we don't care what they are if they can talk you know if they can talk fiber channel or iSCSI well 8 gig fiber 16 gig or 10 gig iSCSI then we support them. Um, we're fully integrated and certified with Cisco UCS as well. Okay, so David has asked, um, do you have support for one gig bonded iSCSI or does it have to be 10 gig? Right, so we don't do bonded iSCSI because the way we've designed our array, so some iSCSI arrays tend to have one IP address for the entire array, which hence why they might do bonding. The way we design now is that we don't do that. Each individual iSCSI port on the array will have its own individual IP address, and then each host would connect to each IP, so we don't need to do bonding or have any kind of multi-parting software installed on the host because there's only one IP rather than multiple. Um, if you want to use one gig on us, you can, right? Now, so here's the thing. It's not, I wouldn't say it's officially supported, but we have customers using it. So what you would do is you can get some um, some uh, converters. I actually got some from in for POC this afternoon. So. The cards are 10 gig SFP, but you can get 1 gig RJ45 converters that you put in, and then you can plug in RJ45 and it'll, it'll run at 1 gig. But you can't do, we can't do RJ45 over 10 gig. Thanks, Max. Um, so David has also asked, how is Pure responding to the PCIe technology? Will it be adopted? Uh, I'm not officially allowed to talk about roadmap items, but yeah, we are cognizant of staying ahead of the curve and adopting new technologies. So today, um, you're right, uh, we're connecting over a um, four-lane, six-gig SAS backplane, which you know at the minute isn't a performance bottleneck. But as we move forward with newer technologies, you know we most likely will change our architecture. But I can't say much else. Um, except to be very elusive and say uh, check this space sometime late summer. Thank you Max. 
Um, so Paul um, has asked if you could confirm what you meant when you said there was no um, outage during a component upgrade except, except for a six second pause um, and that a six second pause in most environments could cause a problem. Uh, right, well a six second pause in any environment shouldn't cause a problem because IO timeout thresholds on all servers are generally set to default, um, usually 60 seconds. Um, so if you have an application where a six second pause in IO causes an issue, I would find that extremely surprising because you know, you're going to get an issue with, with any disk array where controllers fail or something fails over or has to take on a workload, that there will be a pause in IO. Now, um, from our perspective, what the pause in IO means is that as we fail the workload, you know, as one controller, sorry, as one controller fails, the other one says I need to take over the workload, there is literally a pause in IO and then the other one resumes at 100% performance. Um, I would, if you check your OS settings and having sold many arrays in my lifetime, um, the recommended settings vary from each vendor to each vendor, but I've never yet seen any storage vendor that would say you can set your IO timeout threshold on the array to be less than 60 seconds. In fact, I think on some of the old iSCSI arrays, we used to set it to 180 seconds because of outage and pauses, etc. Now, admittedly, there are some low latency frequency trading applications where that kind of thing is unacceptable, but that's kind of what I call the tier zero where people would spend millions on uh, you know, a very unique piece of hardware just for that technology. If you're talking SQL, VMware, VDI, then you know, this is exactly what we're doing. It's, it's exactly the kind of thing where you, know, you wouldn't even notice it happen. But again, test it in your environment, come to see it in our labs. You'll see that this six second pause is way better than losing 50% performance until you actually fix things or have an array rebuild that lasts for days. And even then, you know, when controllers, even in uh, you know, controller, you know, in a normal dual controller situation, when things fail over, it's generally longer than you know, six seconds for most arrays because controller A was doing something which it can no longer do. Controller B has to take that on. And in some environments, if controller B is already massively busy, you just can't cope with the workload. So not only do you get a longer pause in I/O, you get a massively degraded service, and we've managed to avoid all of those but happy to show you if you want to actually see it in our labs. We've got offices in Staines and uh, just by Liverpool Street. Thanks, Max. Um, so it looks like that's all the questions we have today. Um, okay. So thank you so much, Max, for presenting, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, so thank if you. you could please fill out the critique form at the end, that would be really useful. If you would like some more information or um, want to set up a meeting or would like to speak to one of our Bytes account managers, please add that to the form, and we will get back to you. Um, so I'll send you all a link to the webinar recording uh, this afternoon. So thanks, everyone, and thanks, Max, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.